Now, please join me on a quick tour of our way to fight peacework under siege in Israel-Palestine. People seem to me to be drawn to two forms of power, uh, which result in two quite different views of the world. One view is from above, top down. The world is seen from the war room, the cabinet office, the CEO's suite, the computer screen in the drone control room. The other view is from the ground, where most of us, or I suppose now I should say 99% of us, live. That's where I'm drawn to seek out silenced voices, stories of people, and peoples who have been written out of the mainstream version, the official version. I believe that finding voice is an essential step to finding freedom. This is the perspective of our way to fight. For Palestinians, freedom in their own country remains cruelly elusive, but their turn is coming. And when freedom comes to Palestine, so, I believe, will it to Israel. When it does, it will not be generals, presidents, or prime ministers, though they will have signed the documents and will get credit in the history books. It will not be they who have created peace, but uh, people like the, the ones in this book, people like us, in fact, who pull down the walls and create the ground in which peace can grow and nurture the seeds of it, despite all of the forces acting against it. I'd like to introduce you to a few of the people in the book, or maybe I dare say the people of the book. Dana, for example, is a student at the Freedom Theater in the Janine refugee camp. Um, the Freedom Theater is a remarkable cultural institution which has survived invasion and occupation and many other hard blows, including the murder of its Palestinian-Israeli co-founder and director, Giuliano Omer Kamis, this past April. Uh, three years ago, the, the theater opened a school for aspiring actors, a logical next step for a theater. There I met Dana, 22 years old, who grew up in the Janine refugee camp. Let me just set the scene here. Fans turn lazily over an unfurnished room carpeted in gray. With a high ceiling, it's an airy open space for imagination to bloom. Present are two women and six men in their late teens to early 20s. The men wear t-shirts and loose trousers, one woman a black head covering and long tailored robe, the other a rumpled orange tracksuit with white stripes. All are barefoot. They wait in varying degrees of restless motion. In mid-Ramadan, they've been fasting since daybreak, and today in Janine, it's close to 40 degrees. Sweat slides down my back, and I'm just watching. Two acting teachers from Sweden enter quietly, Jan and Beatrice, also barefoot, probably in their 50s, wiry and smiling. When I ask permission to observe and record the class, they answer appropriately. We will ask the students. With a word, nam, yes, or a nod and a smile, they consent. They arrange themselves in a circle. With a flutter of his hands, Jan launches a message, an invisible message across the void. The head-covered woman receives it in cupped hands and hands it off to her neighbor. He lofts it across the circle to another. The pace picks up, the message becomes more urgent. To keep it alive, each member of the circle has to be fully alert and responsible and responsive. One lobs it a hot potato, another uh, releases it softly, letting a bird free to fly. After a few minutes, Jan catches the message and folds it to his chest and lays it gently to rest on the floor. During the break, I chat with a few students. One man tells me he has an internet friend in Canada. I can live with the Israelis, he says, no problem. If only they would live with us. The woman in the orange tracksuit agrees to a quick interview in the few minutes left before class resumes. We sit on a stone balcony, a light breeze, soft and pleasant on overheated skin. Born here in 1989, Dana came to the school after she saw a friend perform at the Freedom Theater. At first, I said, it's impossible, this thing in my country in Janine. But then I saw my friend in this play, and I found it very exciting. My friend told me I too can join if I want, 
so I came quickly here. Almost as quickly, she landed her first role as the Juliet of Shakespeare's famous star-crossed lovers. The Freedom Theatre mixes Palestinian plays with international fare, translated into Arabic and adapted to local realities. It's not hard to imagine the relevance here of a play about young lovers undone by the furies of hatred. What does she hope to accomplish here, I asked. I wish to become a big actor, to be famous, and to know everybody. She laughs, blushing a little, then continues. I wish to change the mind of people in my country, to change how they think about things. Like how a girl cannot do anything, and a boy can do everything. I would like very much to change this. Will it be difficult? Yes, she replies, very difficult. In the school, we are just two girls, me and my friend Zatur. Boys can come here, but nobody lets the girls come. When she says nobody, she means families, not the theater, which actually encourages gender parity. At first, my mother said no. She did not like this idea, because I am a girl, and if I do this, people will talk about me. But when she came to see Romeo and Juliet, she was surprised and very happy. Then she told me, every day, you must go to the school. Dana laughs with delight, and so do I. I wonder if there's anything she might like to tell others in the wider world. She nods vigorously. Yes, of course. People outside Palestine, in Europe or America, they don't know about us. What is Palestine, the reality here, the things that happen to us? I wish everybody to know. On CNN, Dana sees the same washes, uh, wash of images that we see. No matter what happens here, the Palestinians are always to blame the Israelis' eternal victims. Her fellow students are heading inside to resume class. Quickly, I ask, if she had the opportunity, what would she tell other people about Palestinians? Without hesitation, she replies, I wish for all people to know us. Sorry, I wish, them, I wish for all people to know us. I want to tell them we are a good people, we have a gift, and if we have some support, we can do something big with our life, which I believe she will. In Tel Aviv, I encountered Zohrat, that's Hebrew for remembering, an organization that strives with fierce patience to bring into Israeli Jewish consciousness deeply buried memories of the Nakba, the ongoing catastrophe that Palestinians endure. Zohrat people argue that as long as Israel, Israel denies the Nakba, they deny the essential ground for a just peace. Here's the opening for the chapter about Zohrat. I called it A Cure for Amnesia. We scan the rounded contours of fading hills, shadows of hidden valleys, tough little shrubs, and cultivated trees gone wild, fig, olive, pomegranate, and carob with long brown-fingered seed pods. Suddenly we have to yield the trail to a squad of speeding mountain bikers, helmeted, sunglassed, and spandex sleek, dispensing shaloms, hellos, over their shoulders as they pass. We're in Canada Park, a short drive northwest of Jerusalem. In the broad valley below, the separation barrier twists across the landscape. On the near side are the low, flat sheds of a large Israeli farm, built in the early 1980s on land belonging to the ancient Palestinian farming village of Beit Sira. Official signs in Canada Park celebrate the area's rich and fabled past. Biblical, the Israelite hero Joshua is said to have fought a key battle here, Hellenic, Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman. As to the four Palestinian villages buried here, there is only deep silence, a blank. How did this happen? In a 1969 interview with the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, then Defense Minister Moshe Dayan offered this explanation. Jewish villages were built in the place of Arab villages. You do not even know the names of these Arab villages, and I don't blame you because geography books no longer exist. Not only do the books not exist, the Arab villages are not there either. There's not one single place built in this country that did not have a former Arab population. Zohrat's first task that it took on was to join Palestinians in identifying 
destroyed villages and insisting that their names, locations, and histories be known. They continue to do this. It's another way to recover silenced voices. In Tel Aviv, my host was Amaya Galili, who is the education coordinator of Zohrat. Here's a little bit about her. <coughs> Born in 1977, Amaya grew up on the Kibbutz Amir in the Galilee, near Israel's northern border with Lebanon. She recalls a junior high school visit to an Arab-Israeli village, about 30 minutes' drive along the valley. This was the closest Palestinian village, she says. I didn't think about it at the time, but later it did seem strange, since there used to be so many Palestinian villages right where we lived. As a young adult, Amaya decided to research the life of her grandfather, who emigrated to Palestine around 1938, helped establish the kibbutz, learned Arabic, and functioned as an informal diplomat between the kibbutz and the, its Arab neighbors in the surrounding villages. He died the year Amaya was born. I started to interview people who knew him, she says. They told me a lot of nice stories about him, including how he helped the refugees after 1948. But when I asked them what happened in the war, suddenly they were embarrassed. They wouldn't say much. I couldn't understand this. I felt something was being hidden. Later, I found out that my grandfather was part of a unit in the Haganah, the pre, that's the pre-1948 Jewish army, that collected intelligence. While he was building relationships with the Arabs, being their friend, at the same time he was collecting information about their villages so the Haganah could have a file in every village, which helped them a lot in fighting the war. Here was the answer to my question, how the kibbutz could have had so many Arab neighbors before the war, but now there are none. It was really shocking to me to discover these two sides to my grandfather. For me, this was an important breakthrough. The breakthrough led her to become involved with Zokrat, the whole idea of recovering lost, buried memory. I think this, what she describes, is one of those powerful moments when the inherited lens begins to slip and hardly anything looks as it did. In Athens this past June, the African-American writer Alice Walker said this of her decision to join the Freedom Flotilla to Gaza. We are freeing ourselves from the myths that have occupied us. I really admired that way of putting it, the myths that have occupied us. When I met Amaya, she was completing the development of a course on the Nakba for use in Israeli schools. As soon as it was released, it came under heavy, immediate attack. Through the dominant lens, remembering what is supposed to be forgotten is a mortal threat. The Nakba course has been banned from schools, and now to mourn the Nakba in public on the day when Israel's triumph is celebrated is a crime. Zohrat members have received death threats for their work. Under these circumstances, I asked Amaya the same concluding question that I asked many others on my travels. While we clean up after lunch, I ask her where she stands on the question of hope. It depends on which day you ask me, she replied. I want Israel to change itself before it's too late, but I'm afraid that we are approaching the moment when it could already be too late. Things are getting worse, worse here, much worse. The wall, the racism. Maybe the state will last 50 or 100 years, but not the way it is now. The problem is Palestinians can be very nice, but as long as Israelis continue to get more fascists, more and more colonizers, why should they be nice? I hope that what I and others are doing will open people's eyes, change their way of thinking, so that somehow if peace can come, it will have a foundation, something to build on. But if there isn't a big movement of people who want real change and leaders who believe that a just peace is the only way, there will be a disaster here. So you see, she concludes with what I read as a rather melancholy smile, I have good days and bad days. Should I conclude then that this is a bad day? Amaya laughs. Not so bad, she says. When I think about how political change occurs, I doubt that it will come fast. It means working slowly, with patience, person by person, knowing in the end that this is work which has to be done.
That's the long haul, which I think is really impressive in people who have been at this already a while. Next we go north to Haifa. One of 1.3 million Palestinian citizens of Israel, Jafar Farah runs the Mosawa Advocacy Center for Arab citizens in Israel. It's housed in an old building which used to be the Middle East headquarters of a British oil company in the crowded, rundown neighborhood of Wadi Nisnas. A lot of history there. Here are two key moments that Jafar told me about in his youth. In his early teens, a cousin invited him to join the communist youth movement in Haifa. It was the only place in our neighborhood where a young person could go. It was either there or the street, he says. They had a library, ping pong, and this football game, and you know that you play with your hands. These things were very important in Wadi Nisnes. Daily life was tough here. On summer nights, my brother and I would stand out the outside the cinema and sell sabras. That's uh, prickly pears, for those who aren't familiar. For us, the cinema was not a place where we watched movies. It was a place to get money so you could pay for such things as school uniforms and medicine. Of course, it was illegal, and the city inspectors would chase us. Jafar Farah continued to have a rather ambiguous relationship with official power. When the top Israeli general publicly denounced Palestinians as crocodiles, he organized a protest at Haifa University. At 18, he'd just been elected to the Arab Student Committee. Shortly after, his parents received a visit from the Shin Beit, the Israeli secret police. They wouldn't talk to my mother, a woman, but they told my father he must force me to leave the Communist Party. My father said I have no influence on him, not since he left home. They said, then who does have influence? His mother, my father said. That was true, it still is. So they told my mother that if I didn't leave the Communist Party, they would throw me out of the university and arrest me. My mother told them, look, this is the only club in our neighborhood. You offer nothing to our kids. You push them to become drug users, losers. I don't want that for my son. If you arrest him for being a drug user, I would be ashamed. But if you arrest him for being politically active, I would be more proud of him. They did, and she was. And the other, another key moment he told me about. At 19, he went to Germany on a student exchange. The event that left the most enduring impact on him was a visit to a Nazi concentration camp. People said to me, why are you going? You're an Arab, he recalls. In fact, I came to believe that every Arab youth should go to such a place in order to understand how cruel human beings can be. This is also related to our conflict here. We Palestinians are paying the price of what was done to the Jews in the Holocaust, not by us, but by Europeans, while the international community remains silent, as it does today. This is part of my identity. I feel that no one can claim that history protects them from becoming fascist. In the time I spent at the Mosawa Center with Jafar, he detailed the uphill struggle to win or even approach equality for Arab citizens in Israel. Mosawa works on many fronts, all at the same time with, as usual, for NGOs, very limited resources. As he puts it, despite everything, you keep trying. During the 19, 2006 uh, invasion of Lebanon, Jafar Farr was arrested in a nonviolent protest in the Carmel neighborhood, where he used to turn on the lights for his Orthodox Jewish neighbors on Shabbat. Before the 2009 election, he was arrested again. I'm not a criminal, he says calmly. I sit with the Minister of Finance to discuss the state budget. I sit at a round table with members of the European Parliament. But I don't have any illusions that I am protected. At any time, a police officer can feel he's a hero if he arrests a human rights defender without thinking twice. Irresponsible people are leading this country to disaster after disaster. Given what I've heard from him today, I have to ask, does he experience despair? He looks at me for a long moment steadily before he replies, there are days when you feel frustrated and sad, you even cry. In the Gaza war, to see 90% of the Jewish population wanting more and more victims 
How can I find the energy, I thought. How can I find the energy to continue talking to my Jewish colleagues? How can I live with these people? Yes, yes, I do experience despair. Some days I want to forget it, leave this place. There are other things I want to do. But when you think of your responsibilities to your children, his, he and his wife have three, and to Mosawa, you can't just wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do something else. In our reality, despair and doing what you want, these are luxuries we can't afford. Let's go now to Jerusalem. Uh, for, now, for more than a millennium, one of the most bitterly contested places on the planet. Fatefully, followers of three major religions believe it contains fundamental keys to their faith. Now the same can probably be said for a more modern faith, Zionism. In a quiet, time-roughened voice, Mayor Margulit asks what I mean by a just peace. I told him I'm writing about people who work for a just peace in Israel-Palestine. Do you mean Oslo, he asks, or beyond? In a context where the word peace can mean almost anything, even an excuse for war, it's a reasonable question. Beyond, I replied, beyond Oslo, far beyond. We're sitting in the, in the living room of the compact apartment that Meir shares with his wife, Suli, and their three children in the Talbia neighborhood of Jerusalem. Before 1948, its tree-shaded streets were lined with elegant villas and lush gardens of wealthy Palestinians. Some of the original residences were demolished, some restored with Moorish and Arabic detail intact. Meir's plain, sturdy limestone building was constructed in the 1960s by Histadrut, the Israeli Trade Union Federation. They wanted to create cheap, nice housing for workers, says Meir. Crowded with potted plants, their small balcony overlooks a courtyard of trees and shrubs that help to moderate the September heat. I've caught Meir on the run between an early morning attempt to thwart the demolition of a Palestinian home in East Jerusalem and a strategy session for his upcoming municipal election campaign. It's this duality of role as activist and politician that drew me to Mayor Margalit. Since uh, 1948, tens of thousands of Palestinian homes have been destroyed by the Israeli army, some in war, many more under the routine brutality of military occupation. Such demolitions are grindingly familiar to Mayor, who is field coordinator with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, or ICAD as it's commonly known. Early in the morning, when the army surrounds a village, he gets a call from an ICAD contact in the village. Local people know which houses have demolition orders. Mayor contacts solidarity activists to go immediately to the target house. Usually the bulldozers don't arrive before 8, so they have time to enter the house, where they try to prevent the bulldozers from demolishing it. At the same time, ICAD's lawyers go to court and try to freeze the demolition. While I traveled in Israel and Palestine, I always knew that I would return to my home, a safe haven in a country well insulated from war and chaos. That is, or should be, the nature of home, a place of comfort and refuge. For Palestinians, it can never be so, as long as house demolitions remain normal policy for the Israeli government. I asked Mayor how ICAD people measure success in their work. He pauses, looks away, then back at me. This is something very difficult, he says. The municipality has a long list of houses to be demolished, so when we freeze one, automatically the municipality goes to the next. We may succeed to save the house of Mohammed, who worked for the, for the municipality. It's not a problem, because next they go to Ibrahim's house. If we save Ibrahim's house, the municipality says, OK, Yusuf is next. So we can feel happy only for five minutes, but no longer because we have to run to another house. We can only say that we have succeeded when we change the policy. ICAD estimates currently that the number of demolition orders in the West Bank and East Jerusalem reaches into the tens of thousands. But you know, Mayor resumes, for us this question of success is not so important. 
We feel in the, that even if there is no chance of success in the immediate future, this is something we must do, not just to get results, but to be human. We know that one day we will succeed. We are sure of that because there is no other choice. In the Talmud, the rabbis say something like, maybe you will not see the results of your work, but you don't have the right to stop working. On the first day of my first trip to Israel-Palestine, I accompanied Dorothy Naor, an Israeli activist, to meet several Palestinian friends of hers in the occupied West Bank, and then to take a look at Ariel, the flagship settlement, or colony, as Dorothy says. I'd read a lot about Israel-Palestine, uh, seen videos, heard interviews, but that day on the ground was my Occupation 101. One of our stops was in the besieged village of Harris. A tall gray concrete tower overlooks the village with dark window slits at the top. The army is watching. Isa Souf welcomes us into a cool slate floored vestibule, greeting Dorothy in Hebrew and me in capable English. He's tall and well built, clean shaven with thinning brown hair. A small wide-eyed girl stares at us from behind Isa's wheelchair, and a young boy who could be five or six grabs at his hand. Isa speaks quietly to him, and the boy disappears into an inner room, followed shortly by his sister. Born here in 1971, Isa trained as a journalist, then switched to physical education. When the Second Intifada erupted, Israeli military raids escalated. The situation was very dangerous here, he says. The settlers in the army cut down more than 3,000 of our olive trees. They killed seven people from the village and wounded more than 50. We were not allowed to drive or walk on the settlers' roads. We couldn't go to work, to the doctor. We couldn't go anywhere without a permit. <coughs> Me, my brother, and my friends, we said, look, it would be easy to take a gun. We would go to the settlers' road and shoot. But life is a gift from Allah, and no one has the right to end it. This is what I believe. Also, we knew that if we did that, we would either be killed or arrested, and our message would end there, as it has for so many Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. To keep our message alive, we chose nonviolent resistance. On the morning of 15 May 2001, Isa's brother called to say an army squad had just entered Harris, and they were firing tear gas grenades. Isa ran to gather children off the street. I heard automatic weapon fire, weapon fire behind me. Tack, tack, tack. I don't know what happened, but I fell down. Two soldiers stood over me, one of them with his boot on my chest. They shouted at me to stand up. I couldn't. I tried to ask for help, but nothing worked. It became hard to breathe. I was losing consciousness. I think I whispered to the soldiers, be human, please help me. I'm going to die. When I woke up in the hospital, the first words I remember were from the physician to my brother. If he lives, he will live in a wheelchair. And so he does. Uh, Issa now spends most of his time um, encouraging and teaching uh, peace and nonviolent resistance to the, his own children and children of the village to uh, embrace the principles of nonviolent resistance. But how, I asked him, how on earth do you promote peace and nonviolence among people who have to endure so much routine brutality? Isa looks at me steadily, silent, for a moment. I think peace is not something you get by pushing a button. War you can get by pushing a button, but not peace. Peace is a result of justice, which you have to build. Now we don't think about complete justice anymore. Israel is a fact. Palestinians are a fact. That leaves us with only one choice, half justice. We accept them to live here, they accept us to live here. We live here together, but in equality. With equality you can have justice, and with justice you can have peace. Is this possible? I don't know. But I also don't know that it is not possible. So I must live as if it is possible. Which is how he and many others do, I think, now I'd like you to meet Daphne Benai, a member of Maxom Watch. She's in a, this is an Israeli women's organization whose members uh, gather evidence of abuse at, as, 
abuses at military checkpoints and intervene with soldiers when they can on behalf of Palestinians. I traveled with Daphne into the legendary Jordan Valley. From the plateau on the Palestinian side, a curtain of dust blurs the Jordanian mountains. The temperature on this October day is 41 degrees. Daphne says it's hotter in the summer. At, the, at its north end, the Jordan Valley forms the border between Jordan and Israel, in the south between Jordan and the Palestinian West Bank, occupied by Israel since 1967. The valley is the only link between the West Bank and the outside world. We descend into the valley on a road that curls through smoothly rounded hills the color of pale sand. It's hard for me to imagine how anything can grow here. Oh, says Daphne, but by the end of winter it's very, very green with the most beautiful flowers. But it's true, most of the year the land is difficult. To survive here you have to know what you're doing and your needs have to be small. As my Palestinian friends here tell me, we don't want more than we have. We're not interested in things of modern life. We just want to be left alone to live as we always did. First time I saw the wall close up, it struck me that as with many other walls, one of its functions is to prevent people from seeing beyond it. It arrests vision, which allows the authorities to define what is on the other side, the other, the terrorist, the enemy. When Daphne and I took me to visit Palestinian shepherd friends of hers in the Jordan Valley, she wanted me to see for myself what few Israelis get to see, let alone people in the rest of the world. Beside the settlement of Rui, with its ranks of plastic greenhouses ringed by razor wire, we visit a shepherd family that Daphna knows. They live in a tent, really a patchwork, a tattered patchwork of old grain sacks and plastic sheet held aloft by a few poles. It has to be portable. Since 2002, they've been evicted four times by the army, most recently because the settlers said they might hack into water pipes that irrigate the greenhouses. In fact, the father asked to buy water, but the settlers refused. Um, Palestinians aren't allowed to drill wells. Today being Thursday, the gate to Tubas village will be open for one hour, so the father has gone to visit three of his children there. We drink sweet, spicy sage tea with the rest of the family. They chat with Daphna and watch me wide-eyed. One son's just returned from buying water in the village, three hours drive each way on the tractor. They have to do this twice a day. Daphna tells me that the youngest daughter, now three, was born on one of the nights when soldiers destroyed their dwelling. They named her Sumud, which means endurance or holding your ground. Suddenly a gray-white rocket with stubby wings whooshes overhead and disappears down the valley. I'm the only one who looks up. Another follows a few minutes later, then another. This is the first time I've seen remote-controlled drones pilotless aircraft that are used for surveillance and bombing. An older son reports that when he was tending the sheep on the other side of the settlement a month ago, settlers came with soldiers and beat him. Then, just for fun, Daphne translates, they surrounded the sheep, making smaller and smaller circles with their jeeps until they ran over three of the sheep. She adds, for people who have so little, you know, three sheep could be their income for a whole year. Two of the girls bring us a pair of goat kids, born that morning, their eyes not yet open. Daphne and I hold them in our laps, small woolly bodies with bony legs. Watching us, the children grin with delight, except for Sumud. She just watches with a steady gaze. Daphne told me that she experiences a mix of rage and despair about how her country treats Palestinians. It led her to commit civil disobedience, joining other Israeli women in bringing Palestinian women and children from the West Bank to the seashore, which used to be theirs, but to which they now have no legal access. In doing this, Daphne and the others broke the law, and they took out an ad in the Israeli press to announce that they had done so. Last week I heard from her that the Israeli government has forced the closure of an Israeli radio station that advocates for peace, not war, 
not insurrection, but peace. Another blow to democracy, she said. So, given her rage and despair, I was moved to ask Daphna about BDS, a very contentious subject in Israel, even among progressive people. Based on the successful international campaign to end apartheid in South Africa, the international grass movements for boycott, divestment, and sanctions is beginning to have impact. Enough impact that the Israeli government has moved from ridiculing it to actually criminalizing support for it. I asked Daphna where she stands on BDS. She sighs. I really don't like that kind of action, she says. It brings a lot of pain, and I'm not even sure it will work. But life is so comfortable in Israel, and if people don't care what harm they do to others, then we need some drastic action to make them realize that being occupiers also damages our own lives. That includes me. I have no doubt my business abroad will be hurt. But we can't go on like this. I don't see Israelis having the motivation to make real change unless something interferes with this good life we have. So I would say that with very mixed feelings, I'm for BDS. I really can't see that we have any other choice. People often said we don't have any other choice, whether they were referring to BDS or working for peace. Last word goes to Hanin Masri. Born in Nablus in 1985, a survivor of invasion and ongoing occupation, she coordinates the English as a Second Language program at Project HOPE. This is a small NGO that provides a wide range of learning opportunities for children and youth in the most devastated parts of Nablus, the old city and the three refugee camps within its uh, the city limits. Here's uh, Hanin. Graduating from school with top honors in Nablus, she won a scholarship to study languages in Jordan. Hanin adds, I think it makes people feel safe. Under the occupation, no one is safe. Who can we trust? Our family, our traditions. When you don't know what will happen next, you turn to what you do know. The hijab is something we know. In which case, I wondered, why does neither of them wear it? Heber responds, I don't require it to know who I am. She doesn't sound defiant, just clear. Hanin says quietly, my mother chooses to wear it, but she has not asked it of me. We walk deep into the old city, a maze of meandering alleys and arched tunnels built of stone. Despite the heavy heat of late summer, it's shaded and cool in the maze, a practical architecture with tiny shops set into walls, making and selling wooden furniture, pastries, vegetables, Spider-Man backpacks, plastic furniture, modern and traditional clothes, CDs, handmade shoes. A donkey stands biblically in a stone niche, eating grain. Small chickens scratch and peck among the cobblestones. See how skinny they are, Hanin says with a grin. They're just pretending to be chickens. In Nablus and everywhere I went in Palestine under the most grueling, difficult conditions, always I found humor and sumud, steadfastness, holding your ground. This isn't the military kind of holding your ground, piece of turf. It's standing true to your rights and your intention not to be moved. Often the humor is bitter and the holding of ground tenuous at best. But there it is. These are crucial elements of survival. They're also building blocks for the future. So to end, on my travels here, I asked Palestinians what they would do if the occupation were to end. Some say they can't imagine it, not in their lifetime. After thinking a moment, Hanin says, if the occupation ended, Palestine would be a very beautiful country for living. So, of course, I would stay. Even with the occupation, I would stay. Palestine is my land, my mother. I would not abandon her. I would like to go to other places, of course, but I would come back to help develop this country, to make relations with all of the world, to let them know who we really are, how we live, how we think. I look forward to that day 
and so do so does uh, our way to fight. Salam, shalom, peace be with you.